didn't grow here, right here. <laughs> but uh, I've always liked that phrase, you know, because it's a very lighthearted, uh, you know, no cares, no cares. And um, even before I came to New Zealand, they were saying, yeah, the, the people, they, they really, they don't uh, uh, live to work. You know, they more just, they get into the, the joy of, of work, but they enjoy their leisure time and their play time, and they, they like to live happy and carefree existence, and then the rest of the stuff is peripheral. And I thought, wow, that's, that fits into just what I always do all the time, too. So I think I'll have a good time out here talking about everything. So um, the, the discussions are really open forums where you can feel free to ask any question that you want. Uh, there's nothing that's taboo. There's nothing that's off limits. Uh, don't say, I don't know, but maybe this question's too personal. Don't. You can't ask me uh, a question like that. Uh, just feel free to ask anything because we'll be talking about uh, divine ideas and divine principle, but the most important thing is the practical application. And, and having the experience of that love and that joy and that peace. Because we really don't need more theologies. We've got plenty of theologies. And now with the internet, it's, you know, you can go around and, <laughs> and check out a lot of things. You know, in the old days, they were like, oh, all these esoteric things and hidden, hidden wisdoms. But now there's just such a free flow of, of information. And so what you find in this day and age where there's so much spiritual information floating around, that really what you want to do is come to discernment or come to a place where you let the wisdom within you uh, guide you uh, moment by moment and just be carried along by this beautiful inner wisdom. So I'll talk a little bit today about discernment. Um, these gatherings, I call them just enlightenment gatherings now because I don't feel, I don't have any kind of affiliation with any uh, book or uh, organization, or country, or theology, or philosophy, or anything. I just stay affiliated with uh, the peace, or the, or the God within me. And uh, that's how I stay happy, is because I don't have any affiliations <laughs> with everything else. Because as soon as you start to affiliate with something of this world, then that's where the defenses come in. That you've got something to protect, or something to defend. And uh, the present moment is just really open. It can't be organized. It's, it can't be possessed by any uh, country or person or place. And it's very, very loving and free-flowing. And uh, it's, it's just very spontaneous. So uh, I can talk about uh, different traditions and uh, a lot of people come from many different pathways. Uh, the pathway that I use uh, for my own awakening to coming to live in the present moment was called Course in Miracles. So, uh, sometimes that's on the flyers and on the website that I have and so forth. And I, I feel a lot of gratitude for that path. And, and some of you are, know that path and have studied the book. So if you have any questions whatsoever about uh, the ideas from A Course in Miracles or the application of those ideas, uh, feel free to ask those. I'd be certainly willing to talk about that. And if you come from other traditions, uh, whatever those traditions may be, you know, feel, feel free to participate fully, uh, because truth is an experience, it's not a dogma or a doctrine or a theology. So uh, don't worry about uh, stepping on anyone's toes or whatever. Uh, I have people that come to these gatherings anywhere, some say they're believers or non-believers, atheists, agnostics, uh, from all religions and traditions and no religions and traditions. Uh, it doesn't really matter because we're going to be talking about ideas that are really universal, and really we're going to be talking about the practical application of how, how to put these into practice in your daily life, which is really what's most important. So you can have the living experience of the peace and the love. So, um, does anybody have any questions or anything you'd like to start off with? And, and once again, uh, I just travel around the country and the world uh, sharing these ideas about love and forgiveness, and living in the present moment. So uh, we can talk about anything from uh, quantum physics to, <laughs> uh, you know, there's quite a wide range of, of topics we can come at this from. But uh, all questions, one question is everyone's question. So don't feel uh, embarrassed at all by any questions that, that you have because it's really helpful for everyone. Um, I'm Gillian Bell from Walkworth. Um, three score years of 10, been in this form. 
um, with the course for 20 years, and I'm finding at this third stage in my life, it is letting go that mother quality that wants to have children happy. Because I realize that that is still holding me back in form. This is my interpretation, and I'm really throwing it open to see if other people have another interpretation. Um, I can sort of relate to the guy in the Old Testament who was asked to kill his son. Was it Abraham or something? I believe that was metaphorical as much as anything. Um, I guess if the lesson behind the experience is hand over. When I got into strife about 18 months ago with anguish for the state that both my kids seem to be in in their 40s, um, the message I got was, you trust me with your life, why don't you trust me with your children's lives? And I, I suspect that that is it. But I have this special relationship as a mother with two children. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that, please. Yes. Well, it reminds me of that passage in the Bible, you know, where the, the, all the apostles are around and, uh, and Jesus' mother, Mary, is coming up and, and uh, you know, they're trying to make a big deal about Mary coming up to the scene, and, and basically he says, uh, who is my father, mother, sister, brother? As he looks around the whole audience, you know, he that does the will of our father in heaven is our father, mother, sister, brother. So yeah, if you're coming into a state of mind where your, your mind is opening to transcend all special relationships, so that you have this sense of unconditional love, agape love, that you could love any person in any uh, culture, in any tradition, just as much and as dearly as you love you know, your own children. And I think what happens a lot of times when we start to move into that, there's a lot of, uh, there could be a lot of resistance to that, but the most helpful way to think of it is, is that you're not um, devaluing your children in any way. You're just including the rest of the universe in with them. So this awakening to the present moment is really an inclusive uh, movement where you're saying, ah, I love you and I uh, am going to embrace everyone with the same love. And those roles, uh, that the mother-daughter roles or the mother-son roles that, that come in when you, when you feel, still feel a little bit of a tightness or something there or something that's restricting, those are still uh, concepts from the past. That, the ego. Yes. They're still, uh, you might say that all roles um, that involve personal relationships and interpersonal relationships are, were set up by the ego to reinforce guilt. So it's as if, you know, you, you seem to come to this world and deal out, uh, you know, parents and siblings and children and people in your environment, um, and the ego is doing the dealing, and that's why uh, relationships in this world have such guilt with them, because it seems like these patterns of guilt just play out over and over. Expectations uh, that were not met, um, either toward projected on parents or children or siblings or you know, priests and nuns and so on and so forth. It goes on and on. And when you get into the holy instant, what you start to see is all those roles and, and all those expectations that go with those roles are getting gently washed away by the Spirit. All roles in this world are, are like concepts that the mind identifies with. And then you might say that they're ego ideals. So let's say you're identified with the mother concept. How good is a good enough mother? And how much guilt uh, comes in when, when you try to measure up uh, with other mothers or with, with a standard that you have in mind? So you see that the, the idea of being a mother is, a, is an ideal, an ego ideal ego ideal, and that you never can uh, quite fully reach perfection with it. You know, it's all, there's always uh, not good enough, uh, could have done better. Uh, and it's the same with the father role. It's the same with roles. Uh, people do it with spirituality, too, where they take on a, a role and they feel like they fail. They don't live up to the role. So as you go deeper in your mind and as you go deeper within, uh, the Holy Spirit or the, the intuitive self, the higher power, slowly loosens your mind from these roles. And you might say that before you wake up from the dream of this world, 
your final role is forgiveness. But it's a very broad uh, concept. It's so big that it encompasses the whole world. It's like a giant blanket of love that just spreads over the whole world. And you can take everybody in your mind and realize that everybody is included in you. And that everybody lives in your heart. And that there's nobody that's outside of you. I, mean, I had a group of people around me, so-called students, and, and every day uh, we would come together just to come at this thing called the I know mind. Uh, because the mind that's identified with being a human being uh, thinks it knows something. It, uh, it, it doesn't have an idea that it could possibly be mistaken about everything. And it thinks that uh, even if there is such a thing as truth, that it has a very important contribution uh, to make to the truth. And the more you follow the spiritual journey, uh, it gets more humbling, and more humbling, and more humbling, to the point that, uh, you know, some of those early workbook lessons in the Course, uh, nothing I see means anything, I do not know what anything is for. Uh, I've had people come to me and say, those are just like introductory lessons, aren't they? This is not where this whole uh, thing is going. Uh, but actually, uh, it's where it's going. Uh, when you get to a point where you can begin to, almost like the Buddhists do, they empty their mind of everything they think they think and know, that's when you start to feel the presence and the bliss of uh, non-judgment. Because what you're talking about, all the, the knowings, uh, those knowings block the, the awareness of the present moment. Those knowings always involve the past and always involve the future. So. How do you get from a mind that thinks it knows something to a mind that uh, is convinced that it doesn't know anything, but is willing to trust that it will be perfectly provided for, uh, that it won't be naive or it won't be, uh, it won't be stupid, it will just be open and free and clear. Uh, that's what I call, that's the practice of spirituality. Um, different traditions have different ways. Uh, some will emphasize meditation, which is just thinking down in your mind, beneath those trains of thought, those judgments that seem to know what, what's happening, what you're supposed to do, so on and so forth. Um, in A Course in Miracles, uh, there's a workbook uh, that has 365 lessons. And when you actually give your mind over to this workbook, uh, it takes you on a journey deep, deep down in your mind to a place where you start to feel more joy uh, you start to experience more and more miracles, and you start to realize that everything is completely provided. Uh, even though uh, your past learning and past conditioning is not uh, needed and not called upon. That the, it's like the Holy Spirit uses the pool of the past, the skills, the abilities, the words that would be helpful. But this is not a choosing of the human mind. He says, if I make no decisions by myself, this is day that will be given me. Uh, so to have a real blissful day and to have a constant uh, blissful, happy, joyful experience, you have to be completely surrendered so that uh, you make no decisions by yourself, literally that you're guided by the Holy Spirit in all things. So how that works out is that these gatherings uh, provide us a forum and an opportunity, the same as the workbook, to bring up topics and start to watch them dissolve away, because there are a lot of beliefs in the mind, beliefs about economics, beliefs about medicine, beliefs about nutrition, uh, beliefs about friendship, and who, what a good friend is, you know. Uh, all kinds of beliefs that are held in the unconscious mind, that are part of this knowing that needs to dissolve away. So when we come together, we begin to explore some of those topics. And we start to realize that uh, what seemed to be known is not really known at all. That was just a, a veil drawn over the truth. And then it ignites by itself. I mean, the, the Spirit of God within you ignites the whole awakening. So all you have to do is have a little bit of willingness to join with that intuitive spirit. And then um, it's like, well, some would say it's like a wild pony ride. It, it can feel very intense as you're going through this awakening because it's like, it can feel disorienting at times, it can feel like uh, like you're, the world as you've known it is starting to turn and spin or to dissolve away and it takes a lot of faith to just hang in there as this uh, dissolving is occurring. But it's worth it because the light at the
the end of the tunnel is, is once you surrender and, and allow yourself to be like burned through it or uh, taken through this process, uh, you're just left in a state of grace, uh, a state where you're not judging anything and you're perfectly uh, provided for. So that's, that's the process. And send the rugby. Yeah, it's good that, you know, the mind is a very deep well, and uh, the Course is a very, very powerful tool. And so, a lot of times it's not unusual for people to have A Course in Miracles as their spiritual path and have it for years and years and years. Uh, the guidance of how you work with it may seem to change over the years. Um, you may do the workbook for a number of times and then uh, be guided to kind of pop open the workbook or the book, more like an I Ching. Uh, kind of a thing where you're pretty well in touch with the Holy Spirit, but occasionally you reach some stuck spots where you're a little turned around and confused and you need an answer. And so you just close your eyes and formulate your prayer. Really just a prayer of help. Uh, bring some clarity. And then uh, many times people can top open uh, the book that way and use it that way. Um, sometimes in the early years with the Course, people will attend study groups and they will be... <coughs> quite structured and disciplined, and that all has its, its place too in the sense that it's kind of like the 12-step program. If, if an addict is coming in and they have a completely chaotic life, a little bit of structure is good if you have uh, chaos in your life, if you're just scattered. And it's the same with the Course in Miracles. It's, it's not assuming that you have a highly trained mind when you begin doing those work with us. It's, it's actually assuming that your mind is not trained. and so. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are going to like take you into the waiting pool first and slowly take you in and slowly ask a little bit more of you as far as the practice periods and take you in and, and let that discipline grow as you build confidence uh, with working with your higher power, working with intuition. So uh, it's, it's also very important to be very gentle with yourself. The ego will try to interpret against the course and interpret against uh, many different things on the spiritual journey with like uh, one defense me mechanism is perfectionism. Uh, some people do the workbook and they, they'll do so many lessons and say, I'm not doing it right, I'm not doing it good enough, I'm just going to stop doing it or start over on lesson one. And this can be a common ego tactic uh, to have, reach a certain point, go back to one, reach a certain point, go back to number one. You should remember when you're doing the text and when you're doing the workbook to just be gentle with yourself and to stay open to those next lessons and know that uh, you're going to forget practice periods, you're going to make mistakes, but don't, uh, like they do at banks where they compound the interest, uh, don't compound the mistakes uh, by thinking, by beating yourself up, uh, oh, I, I messed up, so therefore I, I, I'm a failure at this or I'm not going to be able to do this. Because that's what the ego wants you to do. It wants you to conclude that you're not going to be able to do it. But you are. You know, you, you are going to succeed in this. And uh, it just takes faith and being gentle with yourself. The concept of there is no world. No. And basically, uh, it's the same thing in Eastern uh, philosophy. They call it maya. Uh, maya is another word for illusion that you might say that this entire perceptual world is an illusion. Now, to the mind that seems to be dreaming it and, and perceiving it, it does not appear to be an illusion. It appears to that mind to be reality. And so, because it appears to be real, it's like you find yourself uh, asleep and reacting and responding to the images as if there are real people there uh, doing real things and real activities occurring. And um, initially, there's not an awareness that, that it's just a dream, uh, no different than your nighttime dreams, you know, when you can be lying at home, safely sleeping in bed, and going through all these emotional reactions as your mind is generating this dream, nighttime dream. Uh, but, but what seems to be the daily world, this daily world of, of this room and all the bodies and everything, that this is a dream as well. And um, you, you begin to get a little bit of sense as you work with the Course of the dreamlike dream -like quality of it. Because the more detached you become and the more deeply you go into your mind, you, you have a, a feeling like you're, you're just dreaming a dream or like you're the observer. They call it in quantum physics. Um, if you're the observer of the whole thing. And that a, a, a 
important step towards coming to this is that same lesson 132, Jesus says, there is no world apart from what you think. So you have to start to realize that the world and your thoughts are really identical. Even though all of us have been trained to believe that we have these little thoughts whirling around in our minds. And then that there's this massive cosmos that's out there. And they don't seem to have any direct connection. You know, most people think, well, my thoughts certainly are not uh, influencing uh, the whole universe. Uh, and that's part of devaluing it and uh, believing that your thoughts have no power. And that's part of the dream world. But the more you go deeper in, you start to realize that that the thoughts that you think you think and the world that you think you see are actually identical. So whatever you're thinking about, your mind is so powerful that it's producing the entire cosmos. Uh, the planets, the stars, the spheres. Um, we have a, a movie that we'll probably be showing uh, this week maybe once or a couple times called What the Bleak Do We Know? And it's a movie about quantum physics where the scientists are saying the same thing that I'm sharing. That uh, there is no out there out there. Uh, that it's all just a perceptual world that's being generated by these thoughts. And you can change your mind. You can release these thoughts. And you can release these false beliefs. And in that sense, you start to realize that who you are is the meaning of life. And uh, this world was just a veil of images drawn over your spiritual reality. That who you are is the kingdom of heaven. There's a point in the Course of Miracles where Jesus refers to that phrase from the Bible. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is within you. And in the Course he says the word within is actually unnecessary. The kingdom of heaven is you. <laughs> You are it. You are the very kingdom of heaven, spiritually speaking. You know, your spirit is. But this world is a veil of images that was drawn over the, the Christ mind or this beautiful spirit to be part of an amnesia where you would forget yourself, your true identity, and get all cut up in this little tiny body, in this little tiny personality self that in this world seems to be so important. Right? It seems to be the I. And actually this eye is just like a little drop of water uh, that blends right in with the ocean. Uh, and you're really the whole ocean, not, not the tiny drop. There's a lot of gradations and level in that twisted perception. And it's not very happy either, uh, because it's a judgment. It's saying that some are ahead and some are behind. So if you continue to work with the course, you'll reach a state of mind that's inevitable where you start to see the sameness of all things. Let all things be exactly as they are. That's the way the workbook says it. And, you know, you just, initially, you seem to go through a phase where you're tempted to project or blame somebody or something, or blame the environment, blame the government, blame the, the president or the prime minister, blame the, the scientist or the ozone layer or the somebody, something. You draw it back in your mind and you realize that that it was just a mistaken belief, that really it was the belief in separation that was really the thorn, the thorn in the side, so to speak, or the, the little speck in the eye that was causing all this crazy world. And then when you release that little speck from within, then everything is perceived as the same. You see the big picture. You see the whole tapestry. You don't try to pull anything out from it. So, yeah, there's, there is one more step beyond the happy dream. And the Course says God will take the final step. And then it goes on to say that God doesn't take steps. <laughs> but, but, the, but the final step was actually the first step, or so to speak. When we were created, we were created perfect. And so the final step is nothing more than remembering your own perfection. Uh, it's not like this thing that has to occur in the future. It's just kind of going back and like, yeah, going backwards to the point. Yeah. I always had the image of like, um, like you land on a beach and you, you make tracks all over the beach since we're here in New Zealand, you've got a lot of beaches, you know, you make all these tracks. And then at some point, you, it's like getting a broom and starting to step backwards and, and cleaning the beach <laughs> and wiping away all the tracks until you get to a point where you've kind of wiped away all the tracks. And all that's left is this pristine beach. It's 
got no tracks or indentations left on it. And then you get lifted up <laughs> uh, at that point. And that's, that's more of an idea that time really goes backwards instead of forwards. That really you're just going to unlearn all the errors and mistakes that you thought you had. And then when you're done unlearning this, you are what you've always been. The one called And that's a blazing light experience. Uh, uh, who you are, some of you might have read the literature on what they call near-death experiences, where they, I call them near-life experiences, because they, <laughs> that light is, is what life is. And when they go into the light, you know, they know everything, and it's all telepathic, and, and they know all the wisdom of the universe, and it's, the words fail. That light is, is who we are. That is the light of Christ, you might say, or the Holy Son of God, or whatever terminology you'd like. So, when you go deep in your mind and you learn to forgive the illusions, you're just making your mind ready to remember that light, which is beyond <laughs> description. May I ask you something? Many years ago, when I first came across the course, I'd been reading Yogananda, and I remember at the beginning of my book, I brought it along today for some reason. But it's this statement that he made that really kind of blew my mind. The spirit was one. By the law of duality, it became two, positive and negative. Then by the law of infinity applied to the law of relativity, it became many. Now the one is endeavoring to unite the many and make them one. And I felt that my whole journey with the course was that. And I still read it. I put it aside for months and then I pick it up again. Um, it's a precious gift. Yes. But it does say at the end that you need to do nothing. Yes, how beautiful. That you need to do nothing in the sense that you are what you are and you always remain perfect. And that's the good news. That's what the New Testament was just coming along. Jesus was saying, you can't die. Uh, he did a little skit at the end of his life, a little crucifixion and resurrection skit. And kind of as a little uh, play, you know, kind of like I can't possibly convey the whole thing to you, but I'm going to put a little skit on uh, to show you that you can't die, and uh, and that's what I, I mean. That's the, that's where the joy comes from. Uh, when I years ago I was I worked at a hospice, and all the doctors and the nurses loved me because they said you breathe in here like there's no death, uh, you know, like you go around and you're laughing and and having fun with all these uh, patients that are seeing me on their last days or whatever. And then the patients would always would call me in and we'd have these exciting little conversations about go to the light, you're perfectly innocent, uh, don't hang on, you didn't do anything wrong, you, you know, you're perfectly loved. Then they would check out, uh, they had little encounters with me and they'd check out, I had a high checkout rate. <laughs> Instead of uh, healing the sick and raising the dead, I, I, I cleared out hospice. <laughs> because it's all about innocence. It's not about a body hanging on for a couple more uh, days or hours. You know, it's, it's about recognizing divine innocence. In fact, there was a, a Course in Miracles teacher one time. I was, I was doing the dishes, I think, and I was listening to a tape from a Course in Miracles teacher. And, and they asked the teacher, they said, uh, what does the Course say about uh, life on other planets? And uh, the teacher said, the Course says that there's no life on this planet. <laughs> and uh, I remember, like, I was like, wow. <laughs> First time I heard that one for a while. But, but what it's teaching is, is that biology, as we know it, you know, a body that's born and it ages and grows old and dies, that goes for life here. But life is a state of mind. I mean, if, if you're not happy and joyful, it's like you're kind of one of the walking zombies, <laughs> you know, like one of those... Uh, uh, old, uh, like the Stepford Wives, or you know, some of those old movies, you know, where, where, where they just kind of were walking around like robots. Uh, and, and some of you might have seen the, the Matrix, and there's so many great movies that are coming out, it's where it's like all a big act. And the funny thing is, it's like there's six billion bodies every day trying not to die, trying to survive and make it another day. And, and it's all just a big facade. Because underneath that, there's one mind that's afraid to live, afraid to recognize the one. And when it 
gets so afraid of the love, then it gets caught up into the matrix or into this act of being a separate body with a separate mind. And at some point you start to realize that you want to unplug from the matrix. Uh, and that's where the, the many become one, in the sense that your mind becomes very whole and unified. And, oh yes, then it's no worries, mate. Uh, then <laughs> you really can say it with full gusto. <laughs> And you stop worshipping at the altar of death. Yes, yes. You stop which we do all the time. Yeah. Dream. So what we do is, you know, initially you start to say, wait a minute, if I'm a death worshipper, how am I a death worshipper? You start to expose this unconscious belief system that is involved in judgment. You know how Jesus said, judge not, lest you be judged. That, that the judge is what the death is. I mean, it, and to reach a state of non-judgment is the resurrection of your own mind. Uh, that you're resurrecting your mind like Jesus uh, did 2,000 years ago. It just said, hey guys, there's a better way here uh, than judging. Let's try trusting. Let's try trusting our higher power, you know, and that's what does it. So these, I'm so glad you share what you did because it's, it's really beautiful when you can all come together and just have an open, friendly, loving, respectful uh, dialogue on this. And what you find is that there's a lot of assumptions and a lot of things that are believed to be true that aren't actually true. But the more you come together and you start to question those assumptions, the more they dissolve away. And you feel freer and lighter, you know, like you can fly. Nothing's really taken away. I mean, I don't regret those 10 years of college at all, but I realized that, that when I was in college, I was, I was, the motive for me taking all those classes was for degrees, important jobs, status, you know, all the things, pride, and those kind of things. So those were all ego motivations. And then once you get into the awakening experience, the Holy Spirit can use all your skills and abilities, but they're just aimed at extending love. They're not aimed at uh, puffing up a personality self. They're actually, they, they're aimed at dissolving away that personality self. So uh, what you find you're left with is a state of uh, non-attachment. Um, I was talking earlier today about, I was in uh, Columbia, and there was a, a college professor who, who was very new to the course, and uh, she really wanted to translate at one of my gatherings. Even though we had had a professional translator and a woman who had flown all the way in from Canary Islands to do a lot of the translating. And so the facilitator of one of the groups said, well, okay, you're a part of this group, so we'll give you, take a shot at it. Well, she sat next to me, and the first woman asked the first question, and uh, the translator, she, she was so into the question that she started saying, that's terrible to the woman as the woman was asking the question. She forgot about me, she forgot about the room. It was just like her and the, the woman asking the question, and she so empathized with the question that she lost track of everything. And then she kind of dawned on her that she was supposed to be translating. And so she, uh, I started to speak, let the Holy Spirit answer the woman's question. Well, the woman was so shocked at what the Holy Spirit said, that she's very new to the Course, that her mouth just dropped open and looked at me. She didn't even translate, she just, her mouth just dropped open as she looked at me. And, and so finally it dawned on her again that she was supposed to be uh, translated. So she gave this long translation, it was kind of like that movie with Bill Murray, Lost in Translation, where he's got the commercial, you know, he gives a little thing and then translation. So this, this woman translated these big, long translations because she was so concerned that the woman she wanted to make sure that she got it. And after this long translation, she said, is that okay? She said to the woman, did you get it? Did you, do you understand? Yeah. So, but I had fun with her, you know, we continue on for another half an hour, 45 minutes, because everybody is just so adorable. Everybody has got this love in their heart, and they want <coughs> to contribute, and they want to uh, dive in. And they're, I just see the beauty of that, you know, that everyone is really wants
wants the same thing. And when you get into the joy of that, you, you completely overlook everything else. Because the, that joy and that love is really what it's all about. So there's not, you're not going to be nitpicking over tiny little things when you, you're just there to feel all the, the love and the joy of the world. And that peace would radiate to everything and everyone. So that's why all the saints and mystics have said it's inside out. And when we have things like wars uh, that seem to be erupting in the world of form, that's just an opportunity for forgiveness. Uh, the first Gulf War back in the early 90s, I remember I was, I was at the Foundation for A Course in Miracles and we were, we were doing this seminar on forgiveness. And all week, everybody had their anger and rage coming up around some, some people were angry at Saddam Hussein, some people were angry at George Bush, some people were angry at the media and the way that the media was portraying the whole thing. And so variously as we went through this Course in Miracles seminar, everybody was getting really angry at something. And one woman sat there the whole week, very detached, very blissful, did not buy the bait for anything. And then the last day of the seminar, she saw a, a bird covered in oil. And she lost it. Just absolutely lost it. Like this poor, innocent bird had nothing to do with this war. You know, she, she got angry at, at all human beings <laughs> for, for, you know, having this bird, you know, killed with all this oil. But see, that was just another version of projecting the problem. And, and really what, of course, the miracles is just saying is you've got to recognize that your belief in your own mind and separation, the ego belief, is where the war is. And it's where the anger is. And only the ego gets angry but as long as you identify your mind with the ego, guess who seems to get angry? You. But it's not the real you. It's just the sleeping you that's identified with the ego. So this is why it's important not to, to stuff your anger and stuff your rage. It's important not to stuff your feelings because those feelings need to get triggered and need to come up. And it's okay to feel that anger when you're watching TV or whatever, but it's also okay turn it over to the Holy Spirit and go, I need another way to look at this because I, I, I want happiness and peace in my life. I don't want to hang on and harbor this, this hurt and this anger. So that's what this is really about. It's about not protecting those feelings and emotions. Not going around and pretending, you know, well, a good Course in Miracles student never gets irritated or angry. I mean, if you, if you get into a state of denial uh, and you try to control your behaviors, but emotionally, you're still torn up on the inside. It's much better to be more honest with yourself and to let those emotions come up. And even though Jesus says in the Course, anger is never justified, meaning, you know, when you feel angry, don't try to get into justifying it and blaming and you know, going down that, that whole tangent. But what he is saying is, is that if, as you do the Course, you will seem to get angry. We'll have a lot of emotions that will get flushed up, and that's okay. You know, that's you shouldn't think that you're not doing the course properly uh, if these emotions are getting flushed up. And initially, the Holy Spirit will use those contrasts. You know, you have miracle experiences, and then you have these yucky feelings, and it's very uh, difficult because that's what a split mind does. It's, it swings back and forth between bliss and and yuck until you are able to transcend the ego, and then you, the yuck is gone. I had a cassette tape one time called Beyond the Yuck, and they named it that. So but that's, that's where this is going. So it's just allow those feelings to come up, whatever they are. You know, that's an example of the inappropriate use of denial, of denying the body, because if your emotions, if you're upset, uh, you obviously believe in a lot more than just the body. <laughs> Quite a few of uh, opinions and so forth. So the Holy Spirit sees the body as neutral. And you might say that it's not so much that the body is a good thing or a bad thing, it's just part of how you perceive yourself in this world. And that what you really want to do is you want to learn to interpret the body or see the body as the Holy Spirit sees it, as neutral. So anytime you try to glorify the body, and you try to build it up and make it more than neutral, 
try to glorify it and make it positive and wonderful, uh, you're going to have guilt involved with that thing. And any time you try to, you try to degrade the body, say how, how wicked it is, it's too fat, it's too skinny, it's, it's too slow, it's, it's too ugly, it's too whatever, you know, whenever you degrade it, you're going to fall into the same trap. Because when you, whenever you judge the body positively or negatively, you're making it more than what it is, you know, which is just a communication device uh, to express love, to let the Holy Spirit express love, to smile through it, to hug through it, to speak kind words of, of comfort and cheer through it. You know, the Holy Spirit just wants to use it as a, as a communication device. So the most important thing with the body is, is to start to realize that, that the body is not the problem. Of the body as the problem. Now, how do you uh, come to a, a much higher perspective on the body? Well, the ego uses the body for pride and for pleasure and for attack. So, as long as you're using it for the ego's purposes, it will seem to break down, it will seem to get <coughs> sore, it will seem to uh, fall apart, it will seem to not be very helpful device, <laughs> more of a distraction. Uh, if you're misusing it by, by letting the ego use the body, it's going to misuse it. But if you give the body over to the Holy Spirit uh, to be an instrument to express love, then the body will continue along uh, in a very helpful way until it's time to uh, lay the body aside. It's like you take a sweater off or a shirt off. spiritual vibration in yourself grows stronger and stronger and stronger. You're, it's self-love in the truest way. Uh, it's not narcissistic in any way because we're not talking about the personality stuff. You're just, you're, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, you're really coming to love yourself. And you're coming to a purity of thought. You know how Jesus said, blessed are the pure of heart for they shall see God. All you're doing is you're purifying your heart. You're letting go of false desires, of, of judgments, of grievances stereotypical thinking. You're just freeing your mind up from all that stuff. Then, your vibration, your spirit vibration, seems to grow stronger and stronger, like you're hitting the note. You've got a nice, high, a beautiful note that you're bringing more consistently. Then you start to attract people into your awareness that are, that are reflective of that note that you're ringing. So it's very empowering. Uh, as you start to feel loving, you start to draw more and more loving witnesses. And when you find one that's not so loving, it's just reflecting a doubt thought about yourself. If you still doubt that you're the Christ, uh, guess who's going to act it out? <laughs> Somebody. <laughs> Somebody's going to show up after you've got all these loving witnesses and one shows up. Where did you come from? Uh, it was just another hidden doubt thought about yourself being pure love, about yourself being the Christ. And so, you learn to line up with the Holy Spirit and realize that that's a call for love. That if you are loved, that if someone comes up like that, it doesn't seem to be uh, very loving. They're just calling for love. And guess who really is calling for love? Mm -hmm. It's yourself. 
taking the form of seemingly somebody else. So instead of perceiving them as insulting you, as attacking you, as taking your peace away, you can perceive them as the Holy Spirit is just calling for love. Then you extend the love to them, and you feel great, because it's just as reinforcing that you have the love and that you are the love. You can't give something away that you don't have. So if you perceive a call for love and you give it away, then that's going to wash away that alpha. That's just another washing away of oh, someone with alpha. So it gets more intense as you go deeper into your mind. And there's a section in the self versus self concept section of the Course that says the role of the accuser will appear in many forms and it will seem to be accusing you. But have no fear, it will go at last. As long as you're doubting your own self as the Christ, of course the role of the accuser is going to show up. It may be mom or dad, it may be your sibling, your child, your grandparent, it could be, uh, it could be and of course your miracles group, where somebody will stand up and say, you don't know what you're talking about, you're full of it. Uh, you should go home and read this page in this chapter or whatever. It doesn't matter where the role of the accuser comes from, uh, it's still just an opportunity to extend love and to realize that they're really not outside of you, that they're just reflecting a alpha that's still holding on in your mind. So once you extend the love, then all of a sudden, you'd be amazed how these characters turn around. Uh, my biological father, uh, for years, I was praying and meditating, doing the Course, doing all this very deep inner work. And I don't know what it looked like on the outside, but all I remember, he was calling, he said, lazy, dirty, no good, rotten bum, uh, get a job. Uh, I guess it looked like that from his perspective, but but as I stayed the course, as I kept on doing this inner work, which was so important, then that whole witness turned around, and, and he turned into this most loving character. Uh, the old uh, Jack just completely disappeared, and uh, he was so, before he died, he was so loving and, and generous with me, and uh, said, you know all that stuff you talked about for years? I said, yeah. He said, you were right about it. And he said, I'm back. Mm -hmm. and, and he, when he was younger, he was a very, uh, he was like a lay minister and he was very passionate and, and very into the love. And he just had bought into the, the male sexual stereotype of taking meaningless jobs to provide for the family and do all these things that he didn't want to do. And he got very angry and unhappy until he finally went, no. Oh, I guess I can let all that go too. And so we both, you might say, I let go of it in my mind, and he reflected me letting go of it. So I didn't hold him to the past, he didn't hold me to the past, and we both just met in the present, which was a real present. 